Hello, everyone. This is Scott Guider. My very special guest today is director, writer, producer Jeff Freeman. Jeff, how are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. No, thank you for having me. No problem. I want to thank you for contacting me uh, by email to review Island of the Cannibal Death Gods in 2011. Um, like I told you, off the phone and in my review, um, there's a, I'm not really a cannibal fan, except for like there was a, a real good story behind it. And uh, I was watching this film, like I told you earlier in the review, you know, it was it was borderline average to me, okay? But then when something happens at the end of the film, it totally jumped my score because it was brilliant. I don't want to get too much content, too much talking about it, too much. I don't want to ruin it, but a job well done, Jeff. Thank you very much. And uh, do you want to give the listeners an idea? I'm sure a lot of them can figure it out as Cannibal in the title. But do you want to give the, the listeners an idea about what the, what the movie's about? Well, sure. You know, the, the funny thing is I'm not actually a fan of the Cannibal film either. And uh, I had a, an earlier interview I did with someone that was that would, was asking me all these questions about you know how well, you know which of the cannibal movies influenced you and you know were you a fan of the European and the Italian cannibal movies and stuff and I'm like I- I'm not really a fan of cannibal movies it's just that I had an idea for one and you know and a lot of it was built around the uh, the ending that you talked about and everything um, about the original idea I had and it just blossomed from there um, but basically. What motivated me is, is this is my first feature, and uh, the I've done some shorts that hopefully no one other than film historians well after I'm dead will ever find or see. <laughs> and so when I thought about what I wanted to do with my first feature, the first thing I wanted to do is I thought, well, you know what, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lifelong fan of science fiction. I'm a lifelong fan of horror. I mean, since I'm a little kid, I used to love all the old Universal monster movies and the Godzilla movies and... Uh, and I still think the original Day Deer is still from 1951 is the best science fiction movie ever made. Uh, so I was a fan of, uh, and I'm not that old, but you know I saw it on TV and reruns. And uh, so I said, well, what do I want to do for my first film? Well, you know what? It, it just makes sense for me to do something fantastic, and horror is a good way to start. And I said, well, you know what? Let me give it a shot. And, and honestly, probably this film's a little more suspense than it is horror. Right. Yeah. So, um, that, that's what inspired me all, watching all those films as a kid growing up and I said you know what it's just these films are just so fun and I loved them so much as a kid these B-horror movies from all over the world I said that's what i got to make yep well like I mentioned in the review you know when the movie starts off uh, with the airplane and you have that music in the background you know playing and I said in the review it reminded me of Planet of the Apes the music wise you know, late 60s, late 70s, and, you know, it just, I don't know how to explain it, but you you don't see that too much in today's films where you, you, you threw in old music, whatever. Well, what, what I got is I was lucky enough that early on in the process when I was first casting and looking for crew for the movie, uh, an incredibly talented composer, arranger by the name of Michael Patterson out in L.A. saw my post. He said, Jeff, I'm a fan of these old B-horror movies. I'd love to score your film for you. And I said, I just flabbergasted. I'm like, yeah, of course. He actually had done some work that's been on national television with CBS. And I said, for ha- to have him score the film was incredible. I let him take free reign with it. I said, just give me something that reminds people of those old movies. Just, you know, a soundtrack that would you know, reminisce about the 60s and 70s drive-in horror. And he went nuts with it. And every time he'd send me a piece of music, I'd be like, Wow! Holy crap! Excellent. And tell you right, that's what made the movie really interesting. Starting off is the music, because then it it got you in that mindset that you're watching something from the '70s when it's actually 2011, and that's what I thought was really incredible for this film. You know, like, like I said before, you know, I started watching this, and you know, and I read reviews on IMDb, which you know, I go kind of nuts on some of. The things that people say I try to keep my composure because it's ridiculous how some people you know but watch this and I it was really interesting the cast of characters was interesting and then like I said before when it gradually started getting towards the end of the film and then right at the end I kid you not it was like an unbelievable moment I turned around and looked at my follower and I went holy shit that was perfect I mean, you you wouldn't expect that to happen, and I 
I emphasize that to the listeners right now. Anybody who I recommended to get this film to review for your podcast is keep in mind that you can't take it serious, serious now, but when you watch this, keep an open mind and wait until the end. It's going to change your whole perspective on the film. That's all I, that's all I got to say. You know, we know the, the, the funny thing was, and, and one of the early reviewers um, of the film got this. I, in fact, I think it was the very first person that reviewed the film. And he got, I mean, a lot of people say, well, Jeff, and, and I heard this initially when I did a screen. It's like, Jeff, man, it's kind of slow in the beginning. I said, well, yeah, but that was, in, that was intentional. Right. And I said, you know, if you go back to any of the old 50s sci-fi movies, um, and, and I'll quote a great one right off the top of my head, um, uh, Earth versus the Flying Saucers, the Ray Harryhausen spectacular uh, with, you know, some of his uh, stop-motion animation. And if you look at the movie and you watch it, right at the beginning of the movie, the main characters see a flying saucer. And then it's nothing but dialogue for, like, 25 minutes, okay, until the next science, the next flying saucer encounter. And I said, that's the way all old 50s sci-fi was like. You know, you'd have some big event right at the beginning, and then nothing would happen but, like, people talking and building up, you know, the story, and then 30 minutes into the film, that's when things would start happening again. And, right. and I said, you know, if I'm if I'm really going to pay respect and, 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 you know, homage to those type of films, then I've got to play it that way. Right. And then, uh, if you want, we can talk about some of the characters. Uh, you have Stephen Brack. He played Stephen, Steve McNeil, okay? He was like this, um, an agent, but like all agents, they get rid of the old and bring in the new. Well, at least he thought he was going to. Until after this disastrous cruise, um, then you had Ke- uh, Keenan Browder who played Dave Parker. You had Cassandra Burton played one of the cannibals. Lisa Eva Gold played one of the cannibals. And then the one I want to ask you about: she played a character of Robin Murphy, Florence Lemerle. Mm-hmm. How did you ever come across her? Well, it's actually um, we had done the initial casting, and um, and. You know, probably had about 40 actors show up for the casting, and most of them didn't really fit the bill of the characters that, that I'd written. Um, Steven was in the initial casting. He was perfect for the role. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I'm trying to think who else. Cassandra, Lisa, um, uh, Allison, who played the Cannibal Queen, was in it from the very beginning. She's actually someone that I knew outside of the film. And um, But then I got a, uh, an email phone call from Flo, and she was like, I'm, I, I really am interested in your project. Can you contact me? I'd really like to, to talk to you about it. And I said, sure. So I met her, and she was just so bubbly and enthusiastic and so interested in doing it. And I said, well, listen, let me keep you on deck because I already have a woman to play the lead. And I did. And then this woman, like three days later, had to drop the project. I said, okay. So I, I you know, flow stepped right in, and it was a great choice. It ended up working out phenomenally. And then you have William Newcomb played Wild Bill, Derek Pixley as Deadly Derek, and Bo Yachty as Badass Bo. Now, that's kind of a misleading title for uh, Badass Bo because he was more like a scaredy cat. <laughs> well, you can't use the word, I think, because for your general audience of your podcast, what he gets called several times in the film. All right. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the names of those characters, they were ancillary characters. What ended up happening was Bo initially was a fairly small part in the movie, but then it just kind of expanded, so he ended up becoming actually one of the lead characters. Right. You know, because they're throughout the movie. And does actually have a, uh, a somewhat uh, heroic end to him for being the villain at the start. Right. And uh, and it just worked out, you know, again, uh, you know, Steven and Bo and Flo, all the people I had were just wonderful, you know, and I've told people this many occasions, you know, either through interviews and outside that, you know, to get this kind of cast for a first feature film, the people that were just willing to just go the extra mile and were just excited to be part of the project and and believed in the project, I, you know, it was a blessing. And, and if I could get a cast together like that for every film I do, I, I would be the luckiest person in the world. They were just so incredible to work with. The talented, easygoing, you know, they understood the limitations of the budget and, and were ready to help out and pitch in any way they could. So it was more like a family endeavor, which is what... I you know I hope most of my independent films end up being is is you know groups of people getting together and bonding and enjoying the process. Well, how did you come across Keenan Browder? Uh, Keenan was sent in on the original casting by his agent. He had just decided to get into acting. He had no actual acting experience at all, no classes, no nothing. He 
had done some print work as a model. You know, he's a good looking guy. Mm-hmm. And he came in, and I'm like, you know what? I could see him as the, you know, and he was such a natural when he read the part. It was all so easy. It's it's like he didn't have the, the, the preconceptions that some actors have when they go into a casting. They have to act a certain way. So he was just so laid back. Right. And so natural. I'm like, well, geez, this guy's like one of the best people reading because he doesn't really, he's, he's not really reading like an actor. He's reading like a guy. Right. So it, that was that was just a lucky casting. And of course, Derek Pixley, his uh, brother-in-law. How was he? Uh, well, no, his brother-in-law was. Uh, that's not Derek Pixley. That's Derek uh, McLean. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, Derek McLean. Uh, he actually had some theater training. It was referred to me through Allison, my Cannibal Queen. She's like, I have this guy. He's a really great actor. Uh, I know you haven't cast all the parts yet. Would you give him a chance? So I, I met him and we chatted for a while. I told him about the project and he read. And that again, you know. It's just another person that came across. The best thing about the leads is they came across as so natural. No one came across as hammy, um, except in the way that I made them in the script. You know, right. just the, with the deadpan uh, dialogue and everything. They're just all so natural at what they do. So it was just really great working with them. Very minimal direction required. That's excellent. You know, um, now how long was the shooting for this? I, um, you know, well we only we only shot weekends. Um, uh, and so it was probably about a 16-day shoot total. Uh, normally it was about a 12-day shoot, but then I there were a couple of scenes that I didn't like in the final cut. So I actually was able to get the, the, the actors together a couple more times to reshoot them uh, until I was finally happy with it. And um, but you know this is this this was probably an incredibly challenging shoot just because most of it was outdoors. Uh, we had some extremely severe weather the year I shot down here in South Florida that, that we haven't seen before or since. Um, and it was just, you know, we had to cancel whole weekends of shoots just because of bad weather. You right. know, and you won't normally hear that in South Florida, but that was the case. Wow. Yeah, again, you know, I can go on forever, you know, watching this and, again, the endings. Like, you know, I told you on the phone after I reviewed this, and I said, you know, I said, if the ending wouldn't have came like it did, my whole... Well, I said in the review, too. My whole thought of this film wouldn't be the same if it wouldn't be for the ending. Well, you know, the funny thing is is that the ending I'd already conceived, um, and that was actually kind of how the film got built around it. And then I had the good fortune, probably about two years ago, a year after, you know... About two years ago, about three or four months after Principal Photography had been ended, and I got to meet Herschel Gordon Lewis. And now, of course, I've been inspired by Herschel's works too, being familiar with them from his work back in the '60s and '70s. Mm-hmm. And uh, and we sat down and chatted. He did an interview with me um, for my web page, and he one thing that he said to me that stuck to me, and it just kind of it just happened to be a, a mesh between what I'd already done. And he goes, Jeff, any good horror film has to have a gotcha moment where you, you just shock the audience. Okay? It doesn't matter what the gotcha moment is, but it's got to be one where, where you, you, the people are just sitting there and all of a sudden you come out of them at left field and boom. And I said, you know what, Mr. Lewis? I, I think I've got that in my film. I think most people will not expect what they see. <laughs> Trust me, you don't. And that's, again, what made the movie so remarkable from the time I started until the time it was over. I was like, oh, wow. Fantastic idea. Well, you know? thank you. No problem. And again, listeners, you know, when you watch the film, okay, um, stay with it because what you think it is and what it ends out to be is completely opposite ends and just and the, amazing. And the whole thing is you have to watch the whole film because if you don't get the build-up to it, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't right. shock you. Right. I was like, get out of here. I mean, I... I you know, it's funny, when you watch a film, certain films that I watch, that they always seem to stick with me, and when that scene came up, it sticks with me even today, after I saw it a couple of days ago, it's like, oh, you ruined the moment, or, well, I can't get into detail exactly <laughs> what I'm talking about, but brilliant, brilliant. And you know, the best way is to not only to download the movie and watch it yourself, or to buy the DVD, but you really should buy copies for, like, your closest hundred friends. Everyone should do that, and that way you can have like a good support group to talk about it. <laughs> Boy, that wasn't self-serving, was it? <laughs> well, one thing I will say, uh, my fellow and, and I was watching this, and the first thing he said was, where's Robin? 
So we both knew there was something going on, but we couldn't quite figure it out because she was in a movie and then not. And that's... I will say no more about that because I don't want to give nothing away, but uh, a brilliant movie, Jeff. Well, thank you, sir. It surprised me because, again, I'm not a cannibal movie fan, except for films like Dismal and Hills of Eyes. It's probably the far as I go because there are some really, really super low-budget junk with cannibals, and I get so turned off. You know, there's one way to make a movie, and there's another way a movie just to make it, and cheap special effects for cannibalism movies does not work. It does not work for me. Well, you know, it's, it's funny. I, I'm hoping that, that this will... I don't expect to spark some new revolutionary movement in horror film for cannibalism. Um, because it seems like right now the cultural consciousness is pointing either towards zombies or uh, or glittery vampires. <sighs> um, so that's... I, you know, but... Glittery. There's so many There's so many different... Yeah, well, unfortunately, that's, that's where it is. Gag. Um, <laughs> I can't say anything. She's making a hell of a lot more money than I am. Uh, well, <laughs> but um, uh, but you know what? If it if it does make people think, if it if it does nothing else but make people appreciate some of those movies from the '60s and '70s a little more, I'd be happy because there's there's just such a if if you can step back from our need to see you know incredible special effects with CGI and explosions and everything if you can if you can step back from having to have that kind of a thing you know there's so many good movies from that era mm-hmm. that just buried now and and people don't realize just how great all these films were and and how Hollywood just keeps recycling the same ideas over and over again yep. and um, and I told people I said you know what there was another film shot down here in the 80s it, it became it made two actors careers actually it was called body heat Yep, and Kathleen Turner and William Hurt, and that was actually the the film that started their careers. The sultry, steamy, you know, hot, you know, nude romance and everything shot down here. And until I went to film school, I didn't realize that, that movie was simply a remake of a nineteen uh, what fifty two movie, I think, called Double Indemnity yep. with McMurray and Barbara Stanwyck. You know, and I'm like, this is Double Indemnity, but with Kathleen Turner naked, which I appreciate. I love Kathleen Turner naked, but <laughs> like. It's the same movie, same plot, same you know, same setup and everything. So they just they're just pulling, you know, the same thing over and over again. So originality is something that we really need in uh, in movies, especially independent film. Now I'm going to ask you a quick question. Um, some of the some of the reviews that you've gotten, what was the most common denominator? Um, most of it was you know most of the common denominators access from I've gotten from the reviews were basically. Uh, similar to what you said, in that, in that it, it's you know people appreciate that I'm trying to 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 pay respect to these films from the the 60s and 70s. You know, it's it's it, it really is an homage film. And when people say, well, you know, is it like you know something that Mel Brooks would do? I said, no, Mel Brooks would do his films. You know, he paid respect to his films in those times, but they were parodies. You know, Blazing Saddles, Young Frankenstein, uh, High Anxiety. Those were all brilliant films, but they were all parodies of the genres. You know, Young Frankenstein was a parody of the old Universal Monster movies, and Blazing Saddles was a parody of the Old West uh, movies. Um, you know, because the characters are played over the top, they're played sarcastically with silly situations and dialogue and everything. If you're going to make an homage film, you actually have to play it straight. The, you know, you have to, to take it and say, okay, well, I'm going to make this kind of movie, and that's the way it's going to be, you know, over the heavy, you know, overly dramatic dialogue, you know, the, the semi- Poor production values, you know, you have to just play it that way. But then, of course, I did kind of spoil it a little bit with the big ending, but but right. that, you know, that's that's how those films were made. I mean, you go back and look at any of those movies, you know, uh, the man X, the man with the X-ray eyes, and uh, Doctor Five's Rises, and um, you know, the the very very original Last Man on Earth with Vincent Price. I mean, you know, those are all phenomenal films, and 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 they're played very straight and very dramatic, even though they may seem a little silly to the modern viewing culture. Well, you're right. I mean, that's like a lot of these young kids today, you know. My kids in general, I mean, the 19, the 25-year-olds, you know, when they, when I tell them about the 80s movies, you know, it's like every one of them make a face. (laughs) You mean movies from that long ago, Dad? That's like 100 years, the 80s. Right. And back, Uh back, I mean, I'm sure you and I are in the same wavelength as far as 80s movies. I love 80s horror. 
I love 80s movies, period, because like anything else, we grew up in an era, so we can relate to what they were wearing, to the ideas, to everything. And same goes for music. You know, I mean, my, my kids are into that, you know, that kid rock and the Eminem and, and, and stuff like that there. It's like, God, it's horrible. Come on, people. Come on, kids. Wake up. Listen to some real music. You know, it's, it's you know, this movie here, I think, um, the age group that's going to be able to uh, to enjoy this was pro- I mean I, I could be wrong but m- maybe some of the younger generation might, might appreciate this I don't know but people who grew up in the the 70s and the 80s and the, like the Planet of the Apes type stuff the, the music and stuff and anything from the 70s and the 80s they'll probably be able to relate to quicker than the young generation am I about well, right? Oh yeah definitely this movie you know this movie definitely would appeal to someone in our general age group just because the idea is to, re, you know, and even some of the promotion I've done online for the film and everything, I, I, I really reference the old drive-in theaters. You know, kids today uh, and younger people today, they don't get the idea of, of you know, they're used to going into theater with uh, big comfy seats, uh, with stereo surround sound 5.1 Dolby Digital, and now mm-hmm. it's even going any higher than that with DTS you know, stereo and, and everything on their, their speakers. You know, there was something that was just so special about sitting in your car with that big rusty metal box hanging off your window <laughs> okay playing the music that prob- the playing the sound from the movie on, on a screen that was as big or bigger than an IMAX screen um, you know because drive-in theater screens were you know 40 50 feet tall right and, and twice that wide and and you know just being in that atmosphere with the people and you know there'd have there'd be a concession stand all the way in the back where the, the movie was being projected from and there'd be concession workers and little bench seats and everything you could actually eat food and and uh, you know you know teenage kids making out in cars you know right next to you and there's just something special about that and, and when you talk about that people think oh geez you know jeff you're talking about the 40s and 50s i'm like no i'm not i'm no. talking about the 70s you know up into the late 70s when drive-in started to phase out of our cultural consciousness you know i went to a drive-in i saw star wars in a drive-in so we're talking at least 1977, when drive-ins were still, you know, really popular in the culture. You know, the first time I ever saw Star Wars. Well, believe there. it or believe it or not, in 1982, we still had one in Lancaster County. Um, E.T. I saw in a drive. You know, you can find them around the country still, but they're 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 really a dying breed. Yeah. And it's a shame, you know. But nowadays, but then of course, on the same token, I'm I'm setting up my movie so that it actually can take advantage of the new trends that I see happening in independent movie and actually in films in general, which is online and digital and, and direct downloads and everything. I think that's where everything's going to go in the future. Right. You know, even even movie studios are starting to do that now. You're getting such a, a, a short space of time between a theater release and a DVD download, you know, rental release. Right. These days. Sometimes it's as, as little as four or five weeks. You know, movies in the theater and boom, four or five weeks later, it's, it's on Netflix. Ready to go. Ready to go on... Direct TV instant download, right? Because either they didn't make their money back, or they're trying to just you know, you know, really hit the the hype for um, for the movie keeper while it's fresh and hot, trying to make as much money as possible with the DVDs, or get it out before the pirates get it out and get it pirated all over the internet. So that's where I really think independent filmmaking is going to go. It's going to go direct to download because nowadays, I mean, you're a father, you have a family, you know, you can take your kids. And the wife to the movies, and you know the four of you after four tickets, and a couple of popcorns, and four sodas, and maybe a box of candy, and you're you're invested eighty eighty five dollars in that movie. Yep. As opposed to you drop it, you know, my movie you download directly from a website in the UK. It's three and a half dollars. You pop up some Orville Redenbacher, you crack open a two liter, and the family you know enjoys a movie for under ten dollars. Right. Exactly. Now, is there any news? I mean, do you have any 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 news coming from this? Like any. Uh Deals or any anything that uh... nothing nothing yet. You know, right now we've uh, we've actually only been in full release for the movie. I guess about six weeks now. Sometime in January was when it went into full worldwide release, which is through a company um, called Distrify, uh, and it's available on Facebook. It's available through our website directly, and then it was on, it was released through Amazon for about a month prior to that in uh, December, which of course Amazon is very limited. If you if you sell your film through Amazon's direct distribution, uh, it's only available in the U.S. But this other company, it's now available worldwide. So it's only been out there on the market about six weeks. And I and honestly, 
yours is probably only the sixth or seventh review I've had on the film uh, from a professional reviewer. So it, it hasn't really seeped in to the, the cultural consciousness yet, but I'm hoping you know that you know talking to you and talking to other people that we can start building some of the momentum for it. Right. Now you, you mentioned it's called diverse, Diversified? Dystrophy. And uh, go ahead and, and, and mention that once for other well, filmmakers. Well, I was I actually was one of the actors on my film. Uh, told me about their website, and I checked them out. It's distrify.com. They're a company online uh, that does direct distribution of films uh, through the Internet, through digital download or rental. So literally what you can do, um, you can pay, I think my film is, is $3.49 to, to buy it, or two ninety nine to rent it. And you literally can download it to your computer and put it up on your big 46, 50-inch flat-screen TV, uh, like which is what I think most people start doing these days with movies. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I was checking them out, and I said, you know what, you know, let me check their info, let's see what they're about, let's see if they're on the up and up. And then I saw that um, a man who I'd known of his work for 40 years now, and who had a big impact on my life as a kid, Terry Gilliam, the auteur filmmaker, mm-hmm. who, uh, for people that don't know, did The Fisher King, he did 12 Monkeys, uh, he did Love, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, and, and just a slew of other films. His newest film is now available only through Distrify. So if you want to see his new work, which is a 20-minute short film called The Holy Family, that's the only way to get it. And I'm thinking, well, geez, if, if this is good enough for Terry Gilliam, it's good enough for me. Right. You know, so I jumped up with them, and, uh, you know, we're just trying to get the word out for people to know. And, and people are always, you know, a little skeptical about new things. So I think it's, it's taking some time. Nice. i to check that out. Yeah, it's something if, uh, for people that you know that are making films. It's definitely something that they should look into because not only, and the, the, the more unique thing about Distrify now is not only is it a way for people to download and rent movies, but it's actually a revenue sharing um, venue as well. So if, for instance, just throw it out there, if, if Gruesome Herzog on his blog or on his webpage puts the movie up there for people to download or rent, then you get a percentage of every sale that comes through your website. You actually oh. share in the revenues of the of the sale. Interesting. Yeah, it really is. I mean, you know, you if you really love a movie, you can actually help promote it and make money from promoting it. Okay, so, all right. that's 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 such a great opportunity for not only independent filmmakers but also for the fans of the independent filmmakers. Um, I've got to talk to some really wonderful people since I made Island. You know, just chatting back and forth and becoming aware of their work. Some people that you interviewed uh, recently from Beware the Movie, Jason. And uh, and some of their actors, a couple of young ladies up in Canada, the Saska sisters, which I saw you done an interview with earlier, uh, their film, and uh, you know to you know they've been able to get mainstream distribution for their works, uh, which is great. You know that's a wonderful opportunity to get your film out there and you know and get it in Best Buy and and whatever places are still selling DVDs. I think there's like one or two others maybe in the world, and um, and then um, to get that kind of exposure. But, you know, for the independent filmmaker to be able to go through that route and be able to have people promote your film is great. Wow. Hmm. Yeah, I'm going to check that out because that's, um, that's good info for me because I do talk to a lot of filmmakers that might want to go another route and uh, it, well, might, pay, the, it the, might pay the off. Thing is with independent filmmakers, unless you're an established name, you have to be really careful. You know, it, there's a real danger that you might sign an agreement that... that cost you all the rights to your films in perpetuity for a small amount of money. And, and Lord knows who wants that. Right. You know, you know Spielberg and Lucas and Tarantino and, and Michael Bay and, and all those guys, they can pull the big Hollywood distribution deals, but for, for the rest of us that are not uh, making hundreds of millions of dollars on our features yet, uh, you got to be careful. Hmm. I would definitely check that out. But I do want to thank you for coming on. Oh, I, I really appreciate the time you gave me. No I problem. talking to me. No problem, Jeff. Again, the film is a surprise for me. More of a surprise when it came to the final conclusion of the film. And I think a lot of reviewers that I recommended to you, and probably more to come afterwards, because, you know, when one person recommends, the next person does it, then hopefully that will get a virus on the Facebook for people to want to check out the film, and it can generate some more interest but I thank you very much for contacting me and asking me to review the film. Um, I wish you all the best, and I can really see this thing starting to get out there. And you're always going to have the naysayers and the people who don't understand, 
you know, and that's mostly the ones that basically like to watch top dop, top dollar movies, you know, and they might not quite understand. But uh, the whole bottom line is you have the montage of the 60s and 70s style. So people who grew up watching the late 60s and the 70s and even the early 80s would be able to relate to this film a lot faster. Well, thank you very much. No problem, Jeff. You take care of yourself. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you.